Well, welcome to Life Point Church, new series Sunday. Who's excited about being at church today? Come on. I love it. Good to have you guys with us today. I wanna say a special welcome to all of our first time guests. If you're new here at LifePoint, it's a tremendous honor to have you with us. I wanna greet our online family. It's good having you. And so I also wanna shout out those that are, that are in our annex in Overflow here at our Pine Valley campus. So can we do this? All of our, all of our audiences here in our auditorium. Let's do this. Okay, so I'm gonna test out real quick, all right? I want just the floor of our auditorium. Make some noise for me. Floor of the auditorium. All right, all right, all right. Okay, balcony in the auditorium. Let me hear you. All right, all right, all right. Annex, ready? Let me hear you, go. That was tough to hear. All right, on... There they are. Online, I want a bunch of hand clap emojis. All right, hand clap emojis. Hey, it's good to have you guys. If you are new to LifePoint, my name is Jeff. I have the privilege of pastoring here at LifePoint Church. And brand new series, Any Given Sunday. I wanna preach a message today that I've titled Game of Inches. Game of Inches. I wanna encourage you to take some notes. If you'll uh, find a note card right there on the seat back in front of you. If you would rather take notes digitally, you can get your phone out and open the LifePoint app. You'll find in there all the notes for today. You can uh, also open a note-taking app or a Bible app to be able to follow along with us. But you'll also, you'll find that note card right there on your seat back, looks just like this. I'd encourage you to write down across the top, Game of Inches, Game of Inches, Game of Inches. Something about having this football in my hand makes me wanna just chuck this thing. Like somebody in the balcony, go deep, ready, ready? Okay, right there, here, I'm just kidding. I would break all kinds of lights and probably that big TV in the process, so we won't do that. I'll just hold it. So do this, raise your hand for me if you played any kind of organizational football in your life growing up. So like Pee Wee, Pop Warner, keep it up, keep it up, flag football, uh, middle school, high school, arena football, Canadian Football League, Professional football, all right, all right. So I'd give it about 20%. Go ahead and put them down, 20%. So I just wanna set the record that I never played any kind of professional football. Um, I never played any kind of organizational football. Matter of fact, I never played football on a team, all right? I know as large of a frame as I have, you probably find that as a shock. A little more of a Rudy Rudiger kind of kind of build. Um, but But... But for what it's worth, I played a lot of backyard football and Madden growing up, okay? Who played backyard football? Backyard football is like, you don't have any pads in backyard football, right? Backyard football, you, you can get killed playing that. And uh, you had like stumps and like septic drains, things you had to watch out for, backyard football. And then I played Madden growing up. I know Madden's still a thing, but how many played video games, play f- video football? Yeah, so when I would play football, Every play, the goal is to score a touchdown, which I know that's like, isn't that always the goal? And and no, it's not. Sometimes the goal is just to get a couple yards. But like backyard football, how many remember backyard football? You had to put the football down because that was the line of scrimmage, and then you backed up. And there was always that one guy on defense, the guy that's like close to the line, trying to eavesdrop while you're back here, and the quarterback always called the plays. The quarterback was always the most athletic of like the kids in the neighborhood. And I remember my, we would play sometimes, and if, if a dad showed up, the dad was always the quarterback. So that was like an unwritten rule. I think it's because the dads just didn't want to run, and, and they were bigger than the kids, so they would be. So my dad would be the quarterback, and if he wasn't there, it was, you know, we kind of pick whoever had the best arm. And every play was drawn out on the palm of your hand. Remember that? Be like, all right, here's what you're gonna do. So my dad would be like, all right, all right, Jeff, three steps out, button hook. Nobody ever told me what a button hook was, okay? I don't even know why it's called a button hook, but I just figured that probably meant run about three steps, turn around. He wasn't gonna throw it to me anyway. And so button hook, I was more like a diversion. Brian, Brian's my older brother. He was always more athletic than me. Brian, you're gonna go long, I'm gonna hit you on the fly. So what am I doing? You're just gonna button hook, all right? You're just, but you just get in their way if you can. That's really what I want you to do, Jeff, because you're not very fast. And so you had to save my speed for those rare moments, you needed somebody to not run fast. And, and so my dad would always draw it up and then you'd get out and then you would run the play. And then there was always that, like, you, you couldn't just blitz, right? 
you had to count to like five Mississippi. Whoever determined that, that it needed to be five Mississippi, why not another state, right? I don't understand where that even originated. So it was like one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, four Mississippi, five Mississippi. Then you could blitz. And so we would run this play, and if the play didn't work, you'd huddle back up, and what, did, what, did, what, did, what happened? Dad was like, same thing, same thing. <laughs> so that was what, that was what my, my football growing up was like. It was backyard football. It was always, it was like go and just get open and we're gonna try to score a touchdown. And so my mentality with football is like, I don't ever wanna run the ball. I like, if, if you ever play me in Madden, I'm gonna go deep every time, all right? Every time, it might be a slant, it might be a Hail Mary. I don't even go into the other options. I'm not, definitely not gonna run the ball. Who wants like a, like a three yard gain? Do you know the average run, the average rush in the NFL is like 3.4 yards? You know how many of those it's gonna take to score a touchdown? Forget it, I want to air it out, I wanna go deep. But life is a game of inches. It's a game of inches. It's in the short, it's the handoffs, it's the little, the little runs. And to be honest, I never wanted to run the ball unless, all right, I'm gonna take it back. Old people, hang with me. Unless I was playing Super Tecmo Bowl as the Raiders. Why? Say it if you know it. Bo Jackson, yes. Okay, here we go. Super Tecmo Bowl. This is Bo Jackson. You couldn't touch him. He was so much faster than anybody else. Look at this, this is the most amazing run in the history of football. He's going, 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 going. Now some of you are like, is that really your graphics? Look, he's going the other way. He's, he's breaking ankles left and right. Bo Jackson was the man. All right, take that away because they're not gonna listen to me anymore. Yeah, now if you're Bo Jackson, you'd hand off the ball, but that, that was a unique Situation, you are no Bo Jackson. Tell your neighbor, say, you're not Bo Jackson. So I always wanted to, I always wanted to throw, it, throw it deep. And typically, we don't think about those inches, life being a game of inches, football being a game of inches, until inches are what we need, right? It's not until like it is third down, the ball is sitting right here, and we're like, oh my goodness, we're so close to a first down, what do they do? They're like, hey, bring out the chains. Where's my chain gang? Bring out the chains. All right, come on out here, chain, chain gang. Yeah. So all of a sudden, you know, these guys bring out the chains. Watch yourself, there you go. All right, and you know how this works. So they bring out the chains, they measure it off. Come on, come on, is it gonna be a first down? Is it, it? and all of a sudden you're like, no, it is short. And they, they gotta lift it up to show everybody, it is short which means now it is fourth and inches. Now, nobody thought about needing a play that was gonna get you seven inches until you are short seven inches. Nobody's like, hey, have we got a play that can get us just a few? No, but now we need that. See, we don't think about needing those inches until those inches are what we need. Chain gang, thank you. You guys can head on back. The best chain gang ever. Didn't you have a mustache earlier, by the way? You look a lot like a guy. No, okay, he looks familiar, I don't know. I put my finger on it. The two and three yard gains, they're necessary. They're necessary, they keep the defense on, on their toes. They're a part of the game, and so often we think about the touchdown passes, the breakout runs, but it's those short plays those little plays, it's faithfully mixing in the short game. You've probably heard this saying, the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single what? Step, right? Yeah, it's the steps that lead to the progress. A life of faith is really just a bunch of faithful steps. A life of faith is really a lifetime of faithful steps. Psalm chapter 37, verse 23 says this. It says, the Lord makes firm the steps of the one who delights in him. I love it, when we delight in God and we live according to his word, he makes our steps firm. It's those steps. And then it goes on and says, though he may stumble, he will not fall, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. God cares about the details. He cares about the steps, the inches in our life. He doesn't just care about the destination, but he also cares about the journey and the process that gets you there. He cares about where you're going. He cares about the way, the route, the steps that you take. In Luke chapter 16, verse 10, look at it this way. The Bible says, whoever can be trusted with very what? Say it, very little 
Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with what? Much. Whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. And so it's learning to be faithful in the inches, in the little things. And so today I wanna talk about a man who is known for his highlight real moments. But if we look at his life, we'll discover it's the inches. It's the small decisions, the small steps that set the stage for these highlight real moments. If you got your Bibles, you can go to 1 Samuel chapter 16. If you got your uh, phones or tablets, you can open up 1 Samuel chapter 16. We're talking about a guy named David. David's an incredible character that we see in the Old Testament. And uh, the Old Testament, if you're not familiar with your Bible, it's broken into two sections, Old Testament and New Testament. And so the Old Testament chronicles the, the, the nation of Israel. They're God's chosen people. And so when we start looking at 1 Samuel, we discover that the nation of Israel has a king. His name is Saul. He's the first king. The people wanted a king. Everybody else had a king. All these other nations had a king. They wanted a king. God said, if you want a king, I'll give you a king. And they have a king. His name is Saul. But Saul turns from the Lord and becomes wicked. And so God says, I'm going to remove Saul. I'm taking my hand of favor off of Saul and I'm going to anoint a new king. And so he sends the prophet Samuel to the house of Jesse to anoint this young man named David. And so this prophet is going to the town of Bethlehem. Bethlehem is like this like blip on, on the map. It's difficult to find. It's not a big city, not even a big town. And in this home is a man named Jesse who has eight sons, all right? That's a whole lot of sons. And his youngest is named David. So with that in mind, let's take a look at 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse one. It says, the Lord said to Samuel, Samuel is the prophet, he says, how long will you mourn for Saul since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. 1 Samuel chapter 16, beginning in uh, verse six, we see that Samuel does what God instructs him to do. He shows up to Bethlehem, he approaches Jesse, he says, listen, great news, one of your sons is going to be the next king. Can you even imagine moms and dads? Like, we all think our kids are pretty special, but for somebody to show up someday on behalf of God saying, I'm here to anoint one of your boys, one of your sons to be the next king, that's crazy. That'd be like, one of your kids is the next president. I know they didn't really do anything to earn this, they've just been chosen. Well, that's what's going on. This is a big deal for Jesse. And so the instructions are, round up all of your boys. We're gonna have a celebration. We won't start till they get here. And so all these guys are getting rounded up. And 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse six says, when they arrived, when they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. Obviously, Eliab's the oldest son. He's like the total package. And so he's looking at Eliab and he's like, man, this guy looks like king material, but look at what God says, verse seven. The Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have, what? Rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So it's not him. Eliab's like, man, <laughs> I was hoping it's not him. Verse eight, then Jesse called Abinadab, and had him pass in front of Samuel, and Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shammah pass by, but Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. So this is beginning to get a little bit awkward. You can imagine being there, it's like, nope, nope, nope. And so it goes on and it says in verse 10, Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel. Now quick, quick review. How many sons does Jesse have? Eight. How many sons have just passed before Samuel? Seven. Again, how many sons does Jesse have? We're missing one, right? We're missing one. So here's what happens. Samuel says to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. So we asked him, are these all the sons you have? They're still the youngest, Jesse answered. He's tending the sheep. You can underline the word tending. I think there's significance in that word tending. So, so here he goes on, verse 12. So, so he sent for him and had him brought in. 
and he was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. So, so Samuel says, go get him. We're not gonna start till he gets here, which this has just gotta be an awkward moment, right? All seven boys, none of which got selected. They're just kind of waiting, waiting for their younger brother who didn't even get an invite, right? Imagine David showing up, he's like, hey, what's everybody doing? What are you guys doing? Oh, well, we were told to round everybody up because one of the boys was gonna become the next king, but we didn't bother inviting you because you're just not king material. <laughs> that hurts, right? That's gonna sting a little bit. You're gonna work that out over many, many counseling sessions together. So all of a sudden, David comes in. He's the center of attention. Then the Lord says, rise and anoint him. This is the one. This is a big moment. This is like his draft day moment, right? He's signing today. This is a big deal. Anoint him, this is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. And then Samuel went to Ramah. This is the moment every younger brother wants when he gets to stand out from his older brothers. His younger brothers, they always kind of catch the brunt of older brothers. And now this is his moment. He's being anointed in front of of his brothers. This has to be a moment. I don't know if he was just so moved and humbled by this moment before the Lord, but I'm thinking there's a younger brother that has kind of got the limelight for once. If I'm the younger brother, I'm kind of looking at my older brothers like, you guys hear this? You getting this? You seeing this? You can call me king, your royal highness. You know, any of that works. You can bow before me now if you'd like to. I'm just thinking I'm the younger brother. This is my moment. And so he's anointed in front of his brothers and we're told that Samuel goes to Ramah. Do you know where David goes after this? Back to the pasture. <laughs> Back to watching sheep. Back to what he has known. You see, David was anointed to be king, but he had not yet been appointed to be king. Do not confuse the two. It wasn't time yet. It's not time yet. He was anointed, but he had not been appointed. And if you start reading through the life of David, about 15 years passes from the time that he's anointed to be king to the time that he is appointed to be king. Turn to your neighbor, say 15 years is a long time. Could you imagine if you knew God has something great in store for you and it's gonna happen 15 years from now? See, he didn't even have the luxury of knowing that. Like he didn't get to pick up the Bible and read his own story. It wasn't written yet. He had to go back to the very place that he came from. He had to go back to being shepherd boy. He's like, I'm king material. Didn't you guys see this? I can't be going back to the pasture. It's easy to lose patience between the anointing and the appointing. It's easy to get restless. It's hard to go back to the pasture when you are destined for the palace. I'm palace material, I'm not past pasture material. I think there's somebody here today that needs to learn the power of staying put in the pasture. God may have given you a vision for what's next, but until you are faithful with what's now, you are not ready for what is next. Now is the inches. It's the faithfulness in the small things. It's doing what God told you to do. It's staying the course. It's staying put. It's tending the sheep. It's going back and taking care of what God had given him to do. I gotta imagine it's hard to be a shepherd when you know you were created to be a king. But here's what I want you to know. I want you to write this in your notes. Would you put this down? Scribble this in your notes. If you quit in the pasture, you will be unfit for the palace. Write this down. If you quit in the pasture, you will be unfit for the palace. See, the pasture was a leadership laboratory. It's where David learned how to lead. It's where he honed his leadership skills. If you can learn to lead sheep, you can, learn, you can lead people. Sheep can be a lot like people, and people can be a lot like sheep. Sheep don't always wanna be led, and they don't always listen, and they don't always make smart choices, and guess what? Leading people looks a lot like that. And if David had quit in the pasture, he would not be qualified for the kingdom. There's some of you that are in positions in life right now, and you know this is not the final stop on the journey, but I'm here to tell you that if you shortchange, if you shortcut this moment, you will be unfit for the one to come. Stay faithful at that job. Stay faithful in that relationship. Stay faithful. Faithfulness now will position you for God's favor later. Don't quit. 
the pasture. Don't quit the pasture. So the first highlight moment of his life is this calling and this anointing. Second highlight moment, and this is probably the the last one I'll have time for, there's, there's a bunch. Second highlight moment, if you're familiar at all with the story of David, I said, tell me what you know about David. You tell me about a battle that David fought. You tell me about David versus, say it if you know it, David versus Goliath, Goliath, yeah, yeah. Mano e mano. David throwing down one-on-one, -on -one, David versus Goliath. Now, I don't know what your church background looks like. If you grew up in church, you probably learned some of this story, probably not all of it. I'll fill in some of the details. Even if you didn't grow up in church, you probably are familiar with David versus Goliath. It's usually an underdog story, right? It's where the little guy takes down the big guy. It's, it's where the new startup corporation takes down the mega conglomerate. It's where the little guy triumphs over the big guy. But have you ever stopped and wondered, okay, wait a minute, wait a minute. So David's not a king yet. He's still a shepherd. Have you ever stopped to wonder how in the world did he even show up to the battlefield to fight Goliath? This doesn't make sense. Well, let me fill in a little bit of the details. So the nation of Israel is at war against the Philistines. And so they're at a place called the Valley of Elah. So imagine a ridge, two ridges with a valley in the middle and the Philistines are set up on one side, the Israelites are set up on the other. And instead of going army versus army, they were going to send their best warrior out to fight. And the idea was, whoever's God is bigger will bring the victory. So no sense in spilling tons of blood. Let's just let your best fight against our best. And so the Philistines have this warrior named Goliath. I mean, he's a giant of a man. And we're told that for 40 days, he would make his way out to the battlefield and he would taunt the armies of the Israelites. He would talk smack about them. He would talk smack about their God, smack about their mom. I mean, it got ugly. But nobody had the courage to go out and fight. And so all of a sudden, we, we hear about this shepherd boy taking down this giant. And it's like, well, wait a second. How did he even get there if he was supposed to be back home watching the sheep? Well, let me fill in some of the details of the story. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, so if you're at 16, just flip over to 1 Samuel chapter 17. In verse 17, the Bible says, now Jesse said to his son David, take this ephah of roasted grain. Anybody know what an ephah of roasted grain is? An ephah is a, is a unit of measurement. It's about 36 pounds of grain. So he's like, take this ephah of roasted grain, these 10 loaves of bread for your brothers and hurry to their camp. Take along these 10 cheeses to the commander of their unit. So, so David is sent on like an Uber Eats mission is basically what it is, right? This is like the very first Uber Eats. His dad is like, your brothers are at war. They're probably hungry. Here's an ephah of grain and some bread and some cheeses for the, for the guys in charge, all right? You're gonna go and deliver it and bring back, he says, take along these 10 cheeses to the commanders of their unit. See how our brothers are doing and bring back some assurance from them. So bring me a report, okay? Let me know how they're doing. Verse 20 it says, early in the morning, David left the flock in the care of a shepherd, loaded up and set out as Jesse had directed. He reached the camp as the army was going out to its battle positions, shouting the war cry. So David is there, he's running this mission. He's like got a DoorDash thing here. He's like, I'm, hey, I'm here. Who ordered the, the, the grain and the bread and the cheeses? I have them here. So he's delivering this. Right about the time Goliath is making his, his you know, taunting speech on the battlefield. And David can't believe what he's seeing. He's like, what, 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 why is nobody doing something about this? Why is nobody taking this giant down? Like he is, he's taunting, he's talking junk about our God. Like somebody needs to shut him up and remove his head from his body. Why is nobody doing this? He can't believe it. And so he starts asking questions. He's like, what's in it for the guy that kills this big old, you know, hunk of a, of a, of a colossal man? And they begin to tell him, they're like, well, uh, it's funny you ask, the king said that he will give wealth to anyone that takes this giant down. David's gotta be thinking, well, I'm gonna be king someday, so I'm gonna have plenty of that. And then he's like, oh, and you're gonna get to marry his daughter. Imagine David's like, anybody got a picture of her? Is there, is she, is she, what's she look like, right? Because if the king's trying to pawn her off, we don't, I don't know. 
But then I think what sealed the deal was the third benefit to the one who killed this giant. He's like, oh, and the guy who kills the giant doesn't have to pay taxes anymore. No more taxes. He's like, done. I'm in. I'm in. Where do I sign? I'll do it. Well, so word of his uh, inquisitive nature begins to bubble up. His brothers find out that he's there. They're like, what are you doing here? He's like, well, dad sent me. I'm delivering some, some grain and some bread and some cheeses. And, and, and so he's, you know, delivering his little cheese tray and stuff. And, and, and so they're like, you just wanted to come see the battle. Get on out of here. You know, big brothers, how they treat little brothers. And so all of a sudden the king hears that somebody, somebody wants to go after this this giant, I mean, nobody has stepped up yet. And so all of a sudden, he, David is brought before the king. And 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 32, we see David in front of Saul, current king, standing there talking to future king. But Saul doesn't know that David's gonna be the future king. I imagine David's like checking out the throne. He's like, yeah, that'd be kind of cool if I get to sit in that someday. This is gonna be, you know, he's probably looking at things like this is gonna be mine someday. This is crazy. And they have a conversation. Here's what happens in verse 32. David says to Saul, this is great, I love this. Let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. You guys, don't worry any longer. You have nothing to worry about. Listen, 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 here's why, here's why. Your servant will go fight him. Like, I, I, I got this, I got this. Saul replies, you're not able to go against this Philistine and fight him. You're only a young man and he's been a warrior from his youth. But David says to Saul, I love this. David says, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. Oh, he's a shepherd. He's a shepherd. I imagine that really brought a lot of comfort to Saul. He's like, oh, okay, you're a shepherd. That's great. But he's like, no, 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 listen. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it. Can we just all agree David's a bad man? I mean, just tell your neighbor right now, say, David's a bad man. Because if I was a shepherd and a lion or a bear got a sheep, I'd be like, we lost a few today, guys. It's just, I'm just gonna be honest. I know you're wondering where a few, look, it was, they came out of nowhere. What was I to do, right? I, if a bear wants a sheep, a bear gets a sheep, but not on David's watch. No, no, look at this. He's like, I went after it. I struck it. I rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by the hair, struck it and killed it. He says, your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he's defied the armies of the living God. And then he says this, the Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul is like, okay. Nobody else is stepping up. I love this. He says, he says go and the Lord be with you. <laughs> like, good luck, man. Good luck. So do, so King Saul's like, well, here, at least wear my armor. And David puts on his armor. And he's like, I can't fight in this. I haven't tested it. This is all clunky. I'm not used to this. He's like, you know what? Just give me my sling. Let me go get five smooth stones. And the rest is history. If you've never read the story, you ought to read it. Just, just mark 1 Samuel 17. Read it for yourself. There's a lot of talking smack. And then there's David. And he's just like, whoosh, 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 wow. Pow, boom, gone. I mean, one shot, one shot, one kill. Headshot. Headshot. And then, this is awesome, because you don't get this if you grew up in VBS, okay? Nobody gets this. Nobody, nobody does this in like kid, you know, with their kids' books. Okay, you just, in the kids' books, it's like, and they lived happily ever after, except for Goliath. That's not how it ended. All right, so all the Israelites filled with courage. They charge after the Philistines. They start slaughtering people. David walks up to Goliath. He's dead. Grabs Goliath's sword and begins to cut off Goliath's head. I don't know if it's like one chop or if he kind of sawed it. I don't know how that swords work, and then he carried it around like a trophy, guys. He, the Bible says that he carried it around. Like, I just imagine bloody head, David walking around. He's like, y'all, you wanna see it? You want pictures with it? They're all getting pictures with it. When he went for the king, he still had the head in his hand. I imagine he took it home. He put that on the mantle, guys. Like, there was the trophy case. That was from Little League. That's when I tried soccer. Didn't really like soccer. That's uh, Goliath. Did you hear about that one? You did? Okay, no, it's cool. I mean, I mean, David was a tough dude. Now, what's crazy is he was also very tender, all right? He was like a lover and a fighter. Like, get you a man who can do both, right? That's, that's what he would write. Songs play a harp, kill you if you crossed him. <laughs> tough dude. I was like, that's trying to, I want to be like David when I grow up. But here's the thing. I mean, highlight moment, right? Highlight moment. 
And here's the thing, if we're not careful, we'll focus on the highlight moment. We'll be like, get, look, give me my sling, give me my stones, I'm gonna go kill some giants. I'm gonna go kill some giants. But you need to understand, it wasn't the highlight moment. It's all the small moments that led up to that. If we're not careful, we'll focus on the highlight, charge into battle, get our butts kicked. You see, what we don't realize is David put in the reps. He put in the reps in the pasture, man. He, he worked his way up to the giant. He leveled up. He started probably just with his sling trying to hit targets, then started running off wild animals, then went after bears and lions, oh my. I mean, it like he, he started small and built up so that when he got to the giant, he had thousands of reps in, thousands of reps. Here's my point, write this down. Practice in the pasture before you step into the battle. We've gotta practice in the pasture before we step into the battle. Some of us are like, man, give me a battle. I wanna fight a battle. I wanna fight a battle. I wanna fight a battle. And it's like, no, 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 no. Because you don't know how to use what you've got. Hone your skills and your abilities. You know the saying, practice makes what? Say it, practice makes? All right, I heard like two different things. Some of you were right, some of you were wrong. Some said practice makes perfect, false. Because you're never gonna get it perfect. Practice makes permanent. And so you play like you practice. David had practiced and practiced day in and day out, showing up, showing up, practicing in the pasture, practicing with his sling. I can just picture him setting up targets, knocking them down. All those reps being logged for this moment. He didn't know when that moment was gonna come. See, that's the thing. You don't know when that highlight real moment is gonna come. And if you, if you choose to just quit showing up, if you quit putting in the inches, if you quit showing up to practice, showing up in your marriage, showing up at the job, showing up at school, if you quit showing up, you will be unfit for when that moment arises and nobody knows, nobody knows. David showed up and it was those little moments that made all the difference. Can I ask you, where do you need to show up? What are the little things that you're tempted to overlook? It's really easy to do. Matter of fact, it's really easy to tell ourselves the little moments don't matter because I'll just make up it with a, with a, I'll make up for it with a grand gesture later. Yeah, you know what? It's a busy, crazy busy stretch at work. And so I can't really spend time with my family now, but in, in, you know, next year we're gonna do a family vacation and in one week we're gonna make up for all those moments that I was absent. And it won't work, yet people do it all the time. I'm not gonna put in the time this school semester. I'm gonna goof off, I'm gonna do my own deal and then I'm just gonna, you know, when the tests come, I'm just gonna ace everything. Listen, you will be ill-prepared for what God has ahead of you. I'm gonna quit focusing on my marriage Maybe a kid is born. It's really easy to focus all, everything in, into the kid. They're pretty demanding. Maybe I'm in a, a stretch at work where if I can just kind of push through and get this promotion, then, then we'll be able to get that time. Then we'll get back to our relationship being a priority. I need you to know it's the weekly date nights. It's the time together. It's the conversations. It's the little things. It's the little things. I see a whole lot of people neglecting the little things and then hoping for one big Hail Mary to fix everything. And I want you to know it's a game of inches. It's saying, God, I wanna honor you in the little things. I wanna be a spiritual giant. I wanna grow in my faith this year. Well, listen, you, that won't happen unless you're in the word consistently. That won't happen unless you, you know, spend time in prayer. That won't happen unless you consistently get involved in church. That won't happen unless you use your gifts and serve. That won't happen unless you get into a small group. It's the little things. It's the little things that prepare you. You can keep reading about the life of David. I had a third highlight moment that I was gonna share with you. I don't have time to get into that, but it's, a, it's not a celebratory moment, it's a sad one. It's a moment where David made a moral failure of epic proportion. But here's what's amazing, is the temptation is to look at that moment and go, what did he do wrong? You ever see somebody fall miserably and we look at that moment? It wasn't that moment. It was all the little moments. It was the inches that were neglected leading up to it. But here's what I want you to know. You can read about this particular one. If you wanna just jot down, you can write 2 Samuel 11. You can read about this moment this week if you want. Here's what I love is while David failed miserably, David was not a failure. Matter of fact, when we talk about David nowadays, we say that David was a man after what? God's own heart. Wait a minute, I thought he messed up royally. Yeah, he did. But God is really good at taking mess ups and reworking their life. You see, when we come to the moment where we realize, man, I have, 
I've been skimping on the inches. I've been skimping. I've been neglecting. I've been sinning. When we have these moments when we're confronted with our sin, confronted with our lives, and we repent of it and we turn back to God, the Bible says he's faithful and just and he'll forgive us of our sins. For some of us today, you've been feeling the weight of those little things that you've been neglecting and you realize it. Here's the great news. You can repent. Repent means, man, I was doing it my way. I, I realize it now. I apologize to God and I'm gonna turn and I'm gonna do it his way now. Repent is a good thing. And if you're here today and you need to repent, maybe it's in your marriage, maybe it's in your, per, your private life, maybe it's in your business, it's in your schoolwork, it's in your walk with God. Listen, he wants to forgive you. He wants to restore you. I'm gonna give you a chance to do that here in just a moment. But some of you, you're here and you don't have a relationship with God. The good news is, the good news is regardless of what brought you in today, regardless of the condition that you showed up to church today, you can leave today forgiven, full of grace, filled with the Holy Spirit. You can leave today with a relationship with your heavenly Father. Some of us have had this idea that I just can't have a relationship with God. It's, it's I gotta earn my relationship with God. I gotta do enough good things to get in God's good graces. And if I can do enough good things, and the reason a lot of us think that is, is we remember when we were little. We remember how the, the, the better we played, the more you know dads seemed to appreciate us, the better grades we got, the more moms seemed to appreciate us. And we thought maybe our Heavenly Father's the same way. And I'm here to tell you, your Heavenly Father loves you right where you are right as you are, but he loves you too much to leave you that way. And if you're here today and you've never been told that you're loved by God, you need to know that's what the Bible says. The Bible says, for God so loved you that he sent his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will never perish but have everlasting life. That's good news, that's good news. Because the Bible also teaches that if we, if we die without a relationship with God through Jesus, we'll spend eternity separated from God in a very real place called hell. Now I know that's not popular. A lot of times nowadays people are like, Pastor Joseph, don't talk about hell. People don't, don't like to hear about hell. I get it, but it's true. And the good news is it doesn't have to be an option. See, the Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You need to know that there was a day that our Father in heaven sent Jesus to live a sinless life, meaning he did not do anything deserving of death and punishment and crucifixion, but Jesus went to that cross that should have been mine and yours, and he laid down his life on that cross. All the sin and the punishment that should have been put on me was put on him, and Jesus brought victory on that cross. He was buried in a tomb. On the third day, he rose again, proving he's the Son of God. And the Bible says if we would declare with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, that we will be saved. The good news today is that regardless of your past, you can know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And if you're ready to begin a relationship with him today, I wanna invite you to make this prayer, this moment, your moment. I'm gonna lead us in a prayer. I'm gonna ask you to close your eyes and bow your heads. And I'm only asking you to do that because it's a lot of distractions. I'm gonna ask you kind of, if you're, if you're getting ready to get up and step out, we're gonna be dismissed. And if you just stay put where you are for just a moment, I don't want anybody distracted. If you'd be honest today, Pastor, I don't know that I have a relationship with Jesus. I want you to know you can know for certain today. And so today, with heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're ready to begin a relationship with God, I'm gonna lead you in this prayer. You don't need to pray it out loud, but you do need to pray it with sincerity. And so right where you are, would you say, dear God, thank you for loving me. I choose today to put my faith and my trust in Jesus. I repent of my sins. I give you my life. I ask you to save me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. change me today. Help me to make the most of what you have given me. Use my life to bring hope to others. Say this, say thank you for saving me. I wanna invite you to keep your heads bowed for just a moment. I believe all over this room, 
in the annex, those watching online, there are people that say, I made that decision today, and here's what I wanna do, with nobody else looking around. If that's you today, I'm gonna count to three, and when I hit three, if you would say, Pastor, I just joined you in praying that prayer, I asked Jesus to be my Lord and Savior, I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand up high on the count of three. And so if that's you, regardless of where you're, you're, you're listening from, I'm gonna ask you to participate. You may be in the balcony, you may be online. You, you can put a little hand raise emoji, you can send us an email. If you may be watching in, in the annex, but if that's you today and you say, I joined you in making this decision on the count of three, I want you to raise your hand up high. One, two, three, right where you are, just slip it up high, saying that's me. Awesome, keep it for just a minute. Way over to my left, yeah. See, hands over here. Continue for another moment. Yeah, back here, right here in the center, absolutely. Way up to my left in the balcony, yeah. Continue for another minute here in dead center, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, one more moment, I don't wanna miss over here to my right. Just keep it up for just another second long. Yes, right here. Incredible, way up there. I love it, I love it, I love it. I tell you what, let's put our hands down and then everywhere, all over this place, come on, can we celebrate together? What a powerful moment. 